Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay. Hey, hey Lon. Hey, hey. Hello there. Hello. Hey. Um, oh, we see you. Welcome. <laughs> this, this is, is wild. Talking. It's just my butt talking. <laughs> <laughs> you want Are you are you wearing your short shorts? <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> are, 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 are you celebrating anything in particular with your short shorts? Um, no, I'm just trying to look sexy in these in these tight pants with the you know fabulous red and the gold. <laughs> are, are the are the short are the short shorts still available to be purchased? <laughs> Sorry, I got a small sparky dog. Uh, Elon, I think you are. Um, you might have broken. Uh, I'm not sure about the internet, uh, but definitely Clubhouse. This room is easily the biggest room uh, the app has ha had, and you're just putting all sorts of pressure on it. it. This is amazing. This is a true historic moment. All right. I mean, is it working? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh all right, we're going to just give it a minute because we promised we'd start at 10 p.m. And I think a few more people are going to try and trickle in. And then we're going to be get we'll get going for what should be probably a historic uh, first ever time for you on Clubhouse. It's going to be amazing. So just give it 30 seconds and we'll get going. <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, um, can you let uh, in Vlad from Robin Hood? I yes. think the roof. We can. Okay, oh, good. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was going to say, uh, you know, uh, I've been, uh, I, my phone just blew up with when we started the room with people trying to get in. So we're going to try and get uh, as many people as possible. Um, okay, why don't, we, why don't we get started? Um, uh, okay. Uh, first of all, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us for what is really a historic uh, episode. Um, I will come to our very, very uh, special guest in a second. Uh, but just to quickly introduce uh, the rest of the room, uh, we have Gary Tan, uh, you know, of Initialized Capital. Uh, we have my significantly better other half, Marty Ramamurthy, uh, whom Elon, you have met uh, when you took us on a tour of SpaceX. Uh, we have Steven Sanofsky um, uh, of X Microsoft fame, and we have the one and only uh, Mark Andreessen. Uh, but to introduce our uh, special guest, and this person truly needs some introduction, um, the founder of Tesla, SpaceX, The Boring Company, Neuralink, PayPal, and which is a bunch more. Uh, Elon Musk, welcome to Clubhouse. Uh, thank you. Uh, glad thank to be you. here. Uh, thank you. Okay. Arti, I think you're first. This question. is awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, Elon, again, welcome. This is really fun. Uh, uh, you know, we've been waiting all day. This is the longest wait to 10 p.m. because we just couldn't wait to get this going. Um, I hope this is as much fun by the end of it for you as it is for us. First question for me was, is uh, when are we going to get to Mars? Well, I think we'll get to, uh, you know, when will we get the first people to Mars? I think we have a decent shot of doing that in about, um, I'd say like, well, I, I Call it five years, something like that. So yeah. Mars, uh, Mars, Earth, and Mars sync, sync up every twenty-six months. That's when we're in the kind of the it's roughly the same quadrant of the solar system, and where we can do an interplanetary transfer. And uh, so we had one about six months ago. So about a year and a half, there'll be another one. So figure, you know, I don't know, uh, five and a half years. Five and a half years. So, what does it take from here to that point? Like, what are the milestones you think for us to like get to? You know, five years out, we are we are landing on Mars. Well, we've got to make a Starship fly, um, get get to go to orbit and back repeatedly. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the essential elements are you need a a fully reusable like well, um, you need a fully and rapidly reusable rock, orbital rocket. This is the, the holy grail of rocketry. Uh, so no one has right. ever succeeded in creating a fully reusable rocket. And it can't just be fully reusable, it needs to be rapidly reusable, so it doesn't take like several months of refurbishment between uh, flights. Um, it needs to be much like aircraft, where the cost of uh, an air flight is, um, the, the biggest component of that is fuel. Um, and um, you, can't, like, you can't just be throwing rockets away every time. Right. Uh, and then you need to have uh, orbital refilling, 
so where you can uh, send the ship up to orbit, uh, then send uh, another ship up, dock with a transfer propellant, so that you can load up um, to being almost full with propellant and then go to Mars. Um, and uh, if, if you, if, but if, you, if you've got a large, fully and rapidly re reusable rocket with orbital refilling, that uses a, um, high efficiency, low cost propellant, uh, then you can go to Mars. And then, and then one other, one last thing is on Mars, to you, you need local uh, propellant production. Um, so you take mm -hmm. CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, combine it with the uh, water ice H2O to create CH4, methane, and, and uh, oxygen. And uh, if you have those elements, uh, life can become multiplanetary and we can have a self sustaining city on Mars, which I think is one of the most important things we could possibly do for uh, ensuring the long term existence of cons consciousness. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, yeah. Th that makes sense. Sorry, sure, I'm going for it. Yeah, um, Elon, you've spoken about this often, which is you know, expanding the scope of consciousness and how it is tied to multi-planetary life. Could you explain what that means for you and why that matters to you? Uh, sure. Well, so the originally, I had sort of quite a, kind of an existential crisis when I was a kid, trying to figure out what's the meaning of life, why are we here, what's the point of it all, is it all meaningless? Uh, I got quite depressed actually, and sad about it. And and uh, and then the thing that kind of broke me out of it was reading Douglas Adams's uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the, the Galaxy, yeah. um, where he he essentially pointed out that the universe is the answer, and really the hard part is figuring out what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. Um, so, yeah, exactly. He was exactly trying to make fun of the fact that the the answer is the easy easy part, but the questions are, are the hard part. So. In order for us to gain a, um, a better understanding of what questions to ask or to understand what it's all about, we have to increase the scope and scale of consciousness so that we're, we're better able to figure out which, which questions to ask and, and answer them. So the longer, the, the, the broader uh, in scope, larger in scale that consciousness is, uh, the more likely we are to be able to answer these questions and figure out what the heck's going on. Why are we here? To answer the fundamental questions. And um, I think there's arguably a, a great filter that we face with, um, you know, will we become a multi-planet species or not? Uh, you know, we'd be surprised if out there in our galaxy and others that there are a whole bunch of dead one-planet civilizations that prospered, prospered for a while. They might have prospered for millions of years, mm -hmm. but then gradually the civilization collapsed for reasons external or internal. And, and that was that. Um, all civilizations go through um, go through an arc where they they, they build they grow up in uh, technology complexity, but then they 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 don't keep going up. They over time they they decline, they fall. And this has happened, obviously, with if, you, if you're a student of history, with many civilizations in the past. You can look at uh, ancient Egypt. You know, five thousand years ago, there was the Great Pyramid of Giza. But then the the people living there forgot how to build pyramids after a while, and then they forgot how to read hieroglyphics. Uh, there's obviously you know Gibbon's famous book about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and how they they had advanced uh, technology in terms of roads, aqueducts, um, plumbing, and so forth, and 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 then they basically people forgot about it. Uh, the the ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, all, all, all these things have they've all gone through a similar arc. Um, which suggests that most likely we will go through it, such an arc as ourselves, and we'll be arguably less resilient to recovery because of globalization. Um, so, I think you know, we're, for the first time in the four and a half billion year history of Earth, it has been possible to extend life beyond Earth um, and make life multiplanetary. And this window of opportunity may be open for a long time. I hope it is, or it may be open for a short time. Um, and I think. It would be wise for us to assume that it's open for a short time. Um, I'm an optimist, not a pessimist, but I, you know, you have to say that there's some chance it's only open for a short time, and we should take advantage of this this brief window of opening, where uh, we can trans transfer life, transport life to, to make life multiplanetary, and and humanity is essentially the agent of life in this process, and I think we almost have an obligation to uh, ensure that uh, the creatures of Earth continue. 
uh, even if there was a calamity on Earth, which, as I said, could be man-made or it could be uh, some uh, natural calamity. As if you look at the fossil record, there's there are many, many mass extinctions. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think uh, you know all of that makes sense, and I think we've heard we've talked about this before. I think one other question I have is, you know, we, when we get there, you know, we have to set up the whole society. We have to set up civilization there. Um, yeah. How, how will the whole thing work in your mind? Like, you know, everything from what does it mean to have internet connection in Mars um, all the way to like governments and rules and laws and everything? Yeah, I think all those things need to happen, yeah. just as they <laughs> happen in, you know, in the US and happen in every, in every country. And um, I, I would not presume to prescribe what should happen there. Uh, I think the important part is just that we get people there and we get the equipment necessary to establish a self-sustaining civilization, um, at least one self-sustaining city. And I think the, the, the key threshold um, of when we would pass the Great Filter, or this, this particular Great Filter, is, um, is Mars sufficiently self-sustaining such that if the ship stopped coming from Earth for any reason, it could be you know, something massive or, or some, something banal. I mean, civilization on Earth could end with a bang or a whimper. And but by the way, if the ships stop coming from Mars, does Mars die out or, or not? Um, and, and Mars only has to be missing one little ingredient, like the equivalent of vitamin C, and it, it will survive for a while, but it will not. But it will eventually die out. So it's kind of yeah. getting getting a student on Mars to pass that that critical uh, threshold where it is self-sustaining. Um, and are we able to do that before some calamity or or a gradual decline in civilization occurs? That prevents the, the, the ships from going there. That, that's the, that's that's the key threshold. In, I mean, in, in a more pithy way, is like does does the city on Mars become self-sustaining? Which comes first, a self-sustaining city on Mars or World War Three? Yeah. If if you if you kind of let yourself dream out over the next few decades, like what would you what would you consider success? Like, let's say they get through the first you know five years and even the first ten years. Like, what do you think is possible to build on Mars 10 years in, 20 years in, 30 years in, after first arrival? Well, I think, I think Mars will go, well, let's start off being very, very tiny, just like a tiny little outpost. And by the way, it's going to be very dangerous. Um, sometimes people think, oh, is this like some escape uh, hatch for rich people? I'm like, uh, no, it will be dangerous, uh, hard work. Um, it's going to be, you're out there on the frontier. Uh, there are way, far more ways to die there than there are on Earth. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it's a tremendous amount of hard work. Um, but it will be, uh, I think, fun and, advent and, and, a, and a great adventure. Um, but it will not be a luxurious thing, that is for sure, not for quite some time to go. Um, but but we, you know, we've got to build a propellant plant, we've got to build the, you know, get the solar power going, get the... Um, you know the the food production going uh start creating the necessities um i you know iron ref we need an iron ore refinery we need you know all of the, the the sort of fundamentals of industry in order to make ensure that mars is a self-sustaining uh, planet um i mean over time like this would take a while but uh, you could terraform the planet and make it earth-like um mostly by just by w warming it up so yeah so, you know, as, as you talk about this, I mean, honestly, what comes to mind is sort of the idea that a Martian civilization, you know, although obviously imported from Earth, it will quickly evolve to be quite a bit tougher um, by necessity. And, and just the mental image just leaping in my mind is the, the Spartans uh, in ancient Greece. Um, like, do you think that do you think do you think the sort of vector of civilization will unfold differently as a consequence of, of, of how difficult it's going to be to get it going? Yeah, it probably will. I think so. And so th then maybe maybe we don't we don't just have a backup, right? Maybe we actually have an alternative, like a, a and a and, and the ability to actually see two different two like fundamentally different civilizations flourish. Yeah, absolutely. The the the, the, the fact that it's you can only go to Mars every two years and that it's a six month six month journey. Although I think we can over time get that potentially as low as one month, but still, it, 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 you can't go to Mars when uh, Earth is on the on the other side of the. The, the sun from Mars, like the you know times where Mar you know Mars is literally on the other side of the sun. You can't get no matter what you do. Um, 
So th that 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 time gap would mean that you know that there'd be essentially a new uh, group of people uh, arriving roughly every two years. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it'd be interesting. People would probably trace their like, yeah, I came on you know uh, tr this this you know. The, the, this particular uh, you know earth mars synchronization event um i don't know it, it, but like like I said, the important thing is is like that we have established mars as a self-sustaining uh civilization um mm -hmm. and, and 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 that we have done whatever we can to ensure the long-term continuance of of consciousness as we know it um because that so as far as we can tell we're the only um the, 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 the light of consciousness, which is a delicate little candle in the dark, uh, it's only here on Earth. I mean, it, it might be else place, uh, other places, and there's arguments that it's likely to be other places, but honestly, we have seen no sign of it. And, and I'm pretty sure that I would have known about it, and I am, I've seen nothing to indicate uh, that there was any alien civilization whatsoever. I would, I, I'd be the first to jump on that in a second, but it, it, I see, I've seen no such evidence. Uh, Elon, that's actually, you know, that's actually something we wanted to ask you about, because in the last year, there has been multiple reported UFO sightings. There was the mysterious object that flew past our solar system. Um, yeah. I think you just described that you haven't seen any evidence of aliens. But A, do you think we'll ever run into them? And B, if we if we do, have you heard of dark forest theory from the three body problem? How do you think we should think about aliens? Um. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to be strict in the scientific sense of the word uh, of saying I've seen no, no, not a single piece of conclusive evidence. So that doesn't mean there aren't aliens. I'm just literally saying I've seen nothing that could not be explained by other means um, and where the probable explanation by other means is much more likely than this alien technology. So, and, and for people who say like there are sightings of aliens, I'm like, listen, man, um, the, the the resolution of the picture needs to be at least like 7-Eleven ATM good, okay? <laughs> I mean, we, we, we can't have that fuzzy Loch Ness monster bullshit, you know? <laughs> it's like, come on, <laughs> we've got like. Is that like a 500 megapixel camera? What? What are you talking about? Where do you even find that thing? It's gonna be. It's gonna be at least like iPhone six level or something. I don't know. <laughs> Can I ask uh, one more Mars question? Um, sure. That's okay, Shira. Um So you know, Elon, you 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 famously have a a pile of you know really beautiful kids. Um, you know, I know I know you care about them a great deal, as as all parents do. Um, what would your response be if they start coming to you when they turn 18 or, you know, 22 and they say, you know, dad, you know, we're, you know, now that you've landed us on Mars and there's a colony forming, like I, I really want to go. Yeah, I think if, if we're talking about, say, the third or fourth uh, set of landings on Mars, I think that'd probably be, I'd, I'd be okay with that. Um, although I've pulled them so far and none of them say they want to go, so... Um, <laughs> They may change their minds, but they, currently they're they're not chomping at the bit to go to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. Um, interesting. Um, Elon. Okay, so um, I think for folks who may not know this, I think we originally met over Twitter, and it's just safe to say. Um, and I want to move to, move on from Mars to memes. It is safe to say that you might be the master of the memes, and in fact, you had a quote: "Who controls the memes controls the universe." Could you just explain <laughs> what you meant by that and how you became oh, this man. person? Um, well, it, I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a play on words from from uh, Dune. Uh, who controls the spice controls the universe. <laughs> um, and and then if if memes are spice, then it's memes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a little bit of truth to it in that, like, like how do you, you know, what is it that influences the the zeitgeist? Like how. Do, how do things become interesting to people? And a meme's like actually kind of a complex form of communication that's um, that like a picture says a thousand words and maybe a meme says ten thousand words. Um, you know, it's a it's a complex picture with a, with a, a bunch of meaning in it, um, and it can be it's it's you know aspirationally funny. Uh, so you know, it's I don't know. I love memes. Um, they. 
I mean, I think they can be very insightful. Um, and, um, you know, throughout, throughout history, I think the symbolism in general has pow powerfully affected people. So, yeah. Um, uh, uh, how did you get so good at them? I mean, um, I remember following you many years ago, going from that to your sea shanties meme or uh, the, the, you know, the, <laughs> any one of the memes, and some of it might, may not be safe for work here. Uh, you know, how did you get we, so we good? Told that Why do we have to be safe for work? We don't have to be safe for work. It doesn't work. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I guess uh, probably. Um, I mean, you know, I, if you go back to my early, very early tweets, or, or technically I was on Twitter, it, I, I, like, I think very, in the very early days when there were only like t maybe 10,000, less than 10,000 users. Uh, <laughs> but then, like, people were just like tweeting, like, what kind of latte they had at the University Street uh, Starbucks. And I was like, I, I don't need to know this. So then I <laughs> deleted my Twitter account. And then, a, and then, a, then a fake person who got my Twitter account and tweeted for a few years, and then uh, my friend Billy said, "Hey, you really should be uh, on Twitter, uh, so you can speak directly to people." Um, and uh, so I was like, "Okay, I'll do." My friend Billy convinced me to, um, you know, regain my Twitter account, and and my early tweets are pretty racy, you know, and like pretty like you know, because uh, I was reading this. Um, Biography of Captain the Great, you know, so mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> it sort of, went, if, yeah, things went crazy from there. Uh, by the way, I like this. Uh, I like how you say that your early tweets were racy and not right now. <laughs> I, I just, I just well, like look, that. Look at your well, profile. I mean, a lot of people think like, oh, he he's gone crazy on Twitter. I'm like, no, I started crazy on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but, what's like your favorite set of new memes, uh, Elon? Like, what what are the new things that you're following now uh, with respect to memes or creating? Sorry, what was that again? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just gonna ask you, um, what what are the new memes that you're like following or creating right now? What are the ones that are interesting to you right now? Um, I don't really follow memes. Um... You just make them. I make some of them, and then some of them are sent to me. Um, I have some pretty uh, kick-ass meme dealers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, wait, who's, who's a meme who's dealer? A meme dealer? Like, is this like Can somebody you meet in the memes, back alley over the signal? Memes, uh, going at a good price. <laughs> are there meme yeah. dealers on Mars? Wait, wait. <laughs> you gotta you gotta have a good meme dealer <laughs> there will be my, my friend mike is a good meme dealer and uh claire as well and uh jake now and a few quite a few others actually i get i, I fortunately am uh, the lucky recipient of very interesting memes okay you know, today well, you're not, you know slightly changing subjects a bit uh yeah. just on twitter Today you had posted about Neuralink and why people should be working there. For folks who don't know about it, I, I thought it was really cool. I, you know, just the possibility of it, just really fantastic. Tell us more about it. You know, there are a lot of engineers listening on this um, in this clubhouse. Uh, you know, what is Neuralink? Why should we care? What is possible with it? Sure. So, um, the the long term. Okay, so Neuralink stems from a concern I had. Uh, Whereas, trying to figure out, even in a benign AI scenario, how do we at least go along for the ride? So, um, I mean, if, if for those that are following AI closely, it's it's obviously improving dramatically. Um, you know, if you see like look look say GPT one versus GPT two versus GPT GPT three, and just how radically that's improved, um, and and just as like you know, a, a deep minds and I mean, I think they've run out of games to win at basically. Um, and there's just, and look, I say, look at, at Tesla. It's a, 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 an important thing at note I should make is like Tesla actually has, I think, one of the, the strongest AI teams in the world, but it's AI team focused on real world usability. Um, so just really solving uh, vision, perception, and control with uh, AI. Um, but, but even in a benign scenario for AI, where let's say like the, the AI is like just really wants to be super nice to us and make us happy. 
but well, how, just how do we stay relevant and still ha and have meaning and at least go along for the ride? Um, that's in the good scenario. And then, and then, and then, in terms of avoiding the bad scenario, to the to the degree we can couple a uh, collective human will to the outcome of artificial intelligence and, and what's developed in that way, I think that'll probably be a better scenario than if we're unable to effectively couple collective human will to that outcome. So, um, so the, the, the final, the, now, sorry, because this is getting kind of esoteric, but- Oh, we love it, we um, love it, keep going. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, people are already a cyborg in, the, in that you already have a tertiary digital layer. Uh, you know, you've got your sort of limbic system, which is your primitive drives and uh, desires and responses. Uh, and then you've got your cortex, which is like long-term planning and thinking. Um, those are your two biological layers. And then there's a tertiary layer, a third layer, which is um, digital. And you already have that in the form of your phones and computers and all your applications. Um, you're far more powerful than, than a human would be without those uh, cognitive enhancements. But the, the bandwidth between your cortex and your digital tertiary layer is very slow. And in fact, with the advent of phones, um, it got even slower. So if you're, if you're thumbing, like, you know, say what's the bit rate of a, of a, thumb, of a pair of thumbs on a, on a phone, it's very low. I mean, let's be super generous and say it's 100 bits per second. Um, well, computers can communicate at trillions of bits per second. So it's... You know, at a certain point, the computer gets smart enough. It's like the computer's just like trying to talk to a tree, you know. Trees do sort of talk, um, but they talk so slow that we don't notice. Um, so, so we need to improve the bandwidth. Um, and with a direct neural interface, um, we, we can improve the bandwidth uh, between your cortex and your digital tertiary layer by many orders of magnitude. Uh, I'd say probably at least a thousand or maybe 10,000 or more. Um, and we could also spend a lot more time thinking about interesting things as opposed to taking complex thought structures, compressing them down into words, which is which also gain a very low bit rate. Um, and then having someone else receive those words, decompress them, and then and then send words back at you. Um, so a huge amount of our brain power is spent in compression, decompression. Um, and we could be instead spending it on uh, deeper concepts. And so if you had a neural link, if two people had a neural link, you could do uh, conceptual telepathy, uh, where you have a complex series, a complex series of, of, of concepts and you could just transfer them directly uncompressed to the other the person this would massively improve the quality of communication and the speed of it so um and then, I mean, there are other sort of pretty wild things that could be done like you could you could pr um probably save state uh in the brain and so if so if you were to die you could your state could be re uh, returned either in the form of another human body or a robot body i mean this is getting like really you know it's weird sci-fi stuff here this is great. This is basically no, like altered carbon, awesome. right? Like this is basically a plot Super line awesome. from altered carbon. Go on, love it. Yeah, love yeah, it. yeah. So kind of like altered carbon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and um, but I think you could decide you want to be a robot or a person or whatever. Um, and, and you wouldn't be exactly the same. So you you know there'd be a little lost in transfer. But you could also say that it's also arguably true that when you wake up in the morning, you're not exactly the same as yesterday, um, or the you of a month ago is not the same as as the you of today. Um, I mean, a bunch of brain cells have died, and memories. Some memories have faded. Some have strengthened. There are new memories. So, anyway, the point is, like, you wouldn't be. Uh, you, you could. There could be something analogous to a video game, like a saved game situation, where you are able to uh, re resume, uh, upload your last state. Yeah, kind of like Altered Carbon. Um, maybe lose a few memories, but uh, but mostly be you. Um, so now, now that's the long term stuff. In the short term. Uh, for Neuralink, uh, the idea would really just be to address uh, brain injuries or spinal injuries, um, and um, you know make up for whatever lost capacity somebody has with uh, with a chip, with with an implanted chip. Uh, so the first thing that we're um, going after is a um, 
a wireless implanted chip that would enable someone who is a quadriplegic or quadriplegic or tetraplegic to control a computer or mouse or, or their phone or really any device uh, just use just by thinking. Um, and this obviously would be a massive enabler, you know, make life way way easier for them. Um, there have been sort of primitive versions of this device, one done with, with like uh, wires sticking out of your head, but it, it doesn't work all the time and, and you can't take it home with you. So just having basically, you think like it, in simplistic terms, I'd say it's, it's sort of like a Fitbit in your skull with tiny That's wires that go to your brain. So Fitbit in your skull with tiny wires. So if somebody who's listening is uh, is good at um, designing like Fitbits, Apple Watches, phones, computers of various kinds, uh, then actually they, they would be a great fit for um, your link. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're, we're I mean, we'll probably be releasing some some new videos showing progress maybe uh, in a month or so. And because um, we already got like um, a a monkey with 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 a wireless implant in their skull and the and the tiny wires, uh, who can play video games uh, using his mind. And he's it's totally really normal. That's amazing. That's, that he looks totally mindful. normal and happy. So it does not, not look like an unhappy monkey, and you can't even see where the neural implant was put in, except for that he's, he's got like a slight like dark mohawk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but other than a that, slight one. Small. Yeah, it look, he, he's not uncomfortable, and he doesn't look weird. Um, so, <laughs> um, so that so we're we're, you know, um, oh, and I was, like when when um, the USDA person came through and inspected our facilities. Our, our monkey facilities. She said it was like the the nicest monkey facilities she's ever seen in her entire career. Just FYI, we we, wow. we went the extra mile for the monkeys. <laughs> they're, they're well, as long monkeys. as long as you didn't make them play cyberpunk. <laughs> <laughs> that that would be a no, that would be a hell of a trip for a monkey. Um, but you know, one of the things we're trying to figure out is, is like, can we have the monkeys play mind pong with each other? Yeah, that would be mm -hmm. super, pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to say the pig demo was really fantastic. That was that was really cool. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's a great team at Neuralink and making good progress. And um, like I said, the it, it, I, I want to be clear, like the early applications will really just be for you know people who've had a serious brain injury, um, like where, where it's like the the value of the implant is just would be enormous. Um, because obviously the, the early implants will come with some non-trivial risk. Um, and so it's got to be like, okay, is, does the good far outweigh the bad? And then, you know, that, that, that would be a candidate for some of the initial surgeries w with full disclosure of like these little risks and everything. Um, and, and one of the things we're, we're, we're really um, paying close attention to is the ability to remove the implant. So it's like, it's not like, you know, for, for if somebody doesn't want it or uh, it's, it's not working, we can take it out and then we can re-implant another one. So we've tested implantation, removal, and reimplantation, say, and, and, and it works great. Um, so, not, um, sorry, Mark, switching top, yeah, please, um, so switch, switching topics, so, um, so Elon, as I, turn, uh, I mentioned kids earlier, as it turns out, I have a, I have a very uh, bright and inquisitive five-year-old um, who is crawling all over everything and trying to figure everything out and learning as much as he can, as fast as he can. Like what, you know, with everything that we know now and kind of all the modern tools that we have, like what's the best way to think about educating a five-year-old in today's world? Sorry, the, the best way to ex educate a Edu five-year-old? Yeah, educate a five-year-old and then think about kind of his education over the course of the next, you know, five or 10 years. Like what, what, what kind of program ideally should you think a, a kid should be on? Hmm. Um. Well, my observation is my kids were mostly educated by YouTube and Reddit, um, and and then uh, you know and, and their I guess classmates and and there were, I guess there were lessons as well. But um, judging by the amount of time they spent online, <laughs> it, it seemed like most of their education is actually coming from online. Um, hmm. I, I, mean, I think generally with the education, hmm. you want to make it as interesting um, and exciting as possible. The I've said like, what are some of the like? If you see like, like, what are all the things like, say, a, a good video game does to keep keep someone engaged and interested? Um, 
you know, if, if they're if, you get, if kids can be super engaged in video games, I think there's a way for them to be super engaged in education as well. Um, like one of the things that's I think very fundamental is to explain the why of of things. Like, so we're teaching you this, but we need we're going to explain why we're teaching you this and why it is relevant. Um, I mean, we've evolved to um, to forget things that are irrelevant or have l low low relevance probability. It makes sense. Like otherwise, we'd remember all sorts of nonsense things that are weren't weren't very important to our future. So unless unless relevance is established clearly, um, then people will have a hard time remember it, remembering it by its nature, but it, because it's they're, they're, it appears to be irrelevant. Um, it, it might be relevant, but if it's not explained to them, they won't know. Um, and then there's if you, you want to have some sort of engage, if you're trying to say say problem solving, some sort of engaging narrative. For, for the problem solving, like um, it's like far better to say, okay, we're going to teach you how an engine works by taking apart an engine uh, and and then putting it back together, and then let, and let's find out what, what tools are needed for, uh, you know, for, in order to take this engine apart and put it back together. It's like, okay, we need screwdrivers and wrenches and Allen keys, and we need a winch um, and uh, you know a bunch of other things, and and then you understand the relevance and um, and it's much more of an interesting problem. Um, this is much better than having, say, a course on wrenches or a course on screwdrivers. <laughs> you just like start with a problem and say, what tools right. are needed to solve this problem? That establishes re relevance and gives a, a compelling narrative thread. Yeah, it seems like you could kind of, if you had sort of elaborate enough projects, you know, you could you could roll a huge number of topics into 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 that ultimately kind of combine into a single project with you know some really actually you know interesting form of output. You know, like you know, for example, you know, building a you know, literally building a vehicle or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it's the business. It, you just it, you, if you have the narrative thread or, the, or like why is it all establish relevance and, that, and there's a story to it and um, and and then and then and you say like well if you know you can't you can't you can't turn off turn that bolt without the wrench um, and then like let's 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 see how can we make this engine better what do we need to do okay well let's calculate um, you know if it's a gasoline engine. You know what? What's the? How, how do you get to a higher RPM or a, you know, a better compression ratio? Um, you know, I'm, I'm using like out, outdated analogy of engines, but um, you could say for an electric motor, um, you know, what what steps would you need to take to um, get higher torque, uh, you know, and pull higher power out of this electric motor? Um, you know, and and, uh, and and then you sort of you can explain. It's it's obvious why. You know things like Maxwell's equations become necessary in that situation. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that'd be amazing. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, Elon, uh, you would not believe the number of parents and people with kids who have asked us about tonight. And I think there are two questions that are connected. One is, you know, how do kids, if you're having a kid and you want to teach them to become a polymath like you have become, what advice do you have for parents? And the next one is, here you are with, you know, a, a, so many companies that you've created that I can't even list them off the top of my head. Why doesn't the world have, and this doesn't mean to sound, you know, psychophantic, but why doesn't the world have more Elon Musk? Well, <clears throat> I don't know. I might be getting too much credit here. Um, so, I mean, for me, these things, uh, the things I've done have been because I felt a strong compulsion to do them. So it's not like... Uh, Nobody was pushing me to do it, but it was just like if I felt strong compulsion to do them. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say, you know, there, there were pretty long sections of my life that have been very painful and difficult, and I'm not sure I would, I'm not sure people would want to do that, you know. Um, uh, this, uh, yeah. Um, if, if somebody wants to be me or do the things I've done, they should, I, I would say most probably you're mistaken. You do not want to do that. You'd have to have some kind of like rage demon in your skull that you, you just got to get it done. There's no, it's like when people ask me like, um, what encouraging words do you have for entrepreneurs who want to do a startup? And my response is, if you need encouraging words, don't do a startup. <laughs> oh. Yeah, quote my friend Bully. Doing a startup is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. Um, yep. For a long time. Yep. 
<laughs> yep. Um, okay. Um, we're going to switch topics just a second. But I think uh, for everyone in the audience who just caught up and managed to squeeze in, um, just a quick reset slash recap. This is uh, uh, the one and only Elon Musk for his first time on Clubhouse. And this is a show that we do every single day. Uh, I know a lot of you are trying to get in the room. There are a bunch of overflow rooms. See if we can get in there. Uh, but we're just having an amazing conversation with Elon. Um, Elon, uh, okay. Uh, this is something you've joked about, but I'm kind of curious to get your, you know, maybe serious answer to this, which is all things cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. You famously just changed your Twitter bio to just the Bitcoin logo and the word Bitcoin this week. What do you think of cryptocurrency? What do you think of Bitcoin? What do you think of other, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies? We'd love to get your take on the entire thing. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I got to watch what I say here because some of these things can really move the move the market um so i first of all i should say like <laughs> uh, m many friends of mine have tried to convince me to uh get involved in bitcoin for a long time like from where it first just popped you know it, it popped out there um and you know a friend of my bully he he actually had bitcoin cake a cake that was like had a bit big sort of bitcoin symbol on it and he fed me a slice of bitcoin cake in 2013 so, I mean, clearly, I should have at least bought some Bitcoin eight years ago. <laughs> like, what what more do people need to do? You know, like Jesus, talk about being late. Talk about being late to the party. Um, um, so I was a little slow on the uptake there. Uh, my apologies. Um, but I I and, and I think about it for a bit. But I I do at this point think Bitcoin is a good thing. Um, and um, so. I am a supporter of Bitcoin. Uh, you, know, you know, like I said, I'm late, late to the party, but I'm a supporter of Bitcoin. Um, and I think it, Bitcoin is really on the verge of getting uh, broad acceptance by sort of the conventional uh, finance um, people, you know. So, um, yeah, I think so. You know, I, I don't have a strong opinion on, on other cryptocurrencies. I mean, I, occasionally I make uh, jokes about Dogecoin. Um, but but they are they are really just meant to be jokes. Um, but I, I don't know, you know, joke, joke, Dogecoin was made as a as a made as a joke to make fun of cryptocurrencies, obviously. Um, uh, but but fate loves irony, and and, <laughs> and, and, and often, as a friend of mine says, the most ironic uh, outcome is the most likely, or as I like I like to say, the most entertaining outcome is is often the most likely, and. Arguably, the most entertaining outcome and the most ironic outcome would be that Dogecoin becomes the, the currency of Earth in the future. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, Elon, when you tweeted me this afternoon, I will say my tweet replies have been overwhelmed by probably like a zillion different like cryptocurrency uh, coins. And But yeah. And by the way, you might remember the infamous time when your replies were filled with cryptocurrency bots on Twitter. Oh, my God. So, that was insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, that was actually how Elon and I actually wanted a meeting because that was a very painful, painful time. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, in fact, and, and, and then I made a joke about Bitcoin and my account got locked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I had to actually try and convince some folks that that was actually the real Elon Musk and try and <laughs> really? get his account unblocked. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I want to, uh, you know, you know, bring us bring us bring us back to one of your companies. Uh, we actually have a uh, Tesla Model S sitting outside our house right now. Uh, it carries us and our two-year-old baby around, and we love it. Um, would love to just get your take on, um, you know, where you see, uh, you know, uh, you just have a refresh of the Model S coming out. I just saw the review for it. Where do you just see, you know, the future for Tesla, and especially when it comes to all things. Uh, battery technology and self-driving those two topics I think a lot of people are very interested in okay so so you're, so you're asking me about the future of batteries and self-driving um more like actually where, where do you see tesla over the next few years um well yeah i mean i think that i mean our goal the goal with tesla is to and has you know has been from the beginning um is to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy um, so, in order to do that, we've got to make a lot of cars. We've got to make them uh, increasingly affordable, uh, and 
um, our, our rough target is we want to be able to um, eventually make 20 million cars a year. And the reason for that is there's 2 billion active cars and trucks on the road. And figure if, if you're not really moving the needle unless you're changing 1% of the existing fleet. Um, and, and so that's sort of roughly how we came up with 20 million car, you know, cars and trucks per year. Um, that, that's, that's very important uh, to you know, accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. And then, of course, uh, uh, we've got stationary battery packs and solar, which is um, making a lot of progress on that front. Um, so, so, yeah, we're, we're going to try to grow um, car production as fast as possible. And, and that the, the, the primary limiting, limiting factor there is battery cell production. Uh, so we're uh, getting as much... Uh, you know as much as possible from suppliers and then but but even that is not enough so we're actually going to be building uh, battery cells ourselves um, and but, but it's impo impo important to em important to emphasize that uh, you know to our suppliers who are great we've got great suppliers that we're, we're, we're not we're not trying to put them out of business we want them to increase their rate as well um, so Panasonic um, LG and CATL um, and then but if to to add you know, to increase the to accelerate sustainable energy further, further we're making our own cells, um, and um, you're pretty, pretty excited about that. Uh, <clears throat> and then, anyway, so I think you expect, you know, possibly an acceleration of, of uh, compound annual growth, uh, or at least aspirationally, that's our goal. And uh, and then that combine that with autonomy, um, and it's a very powerful story. Uh, because if, once you have autonomy of self-driving cars, you, you massively increase the utility of, of any given car. Um, you know, a, a typical car is, is driven about 12 miles, uh, sorry, 12, 12 hours a week. Um, you think of like, you know, maybe <clears throat> depending on the situation, you're where you live, it's like maybe an hour and a half a day or something like that. Um, or in LA, it might be two hours a day. So call it roughly 12 hours a week. And there's 168 hours in, in a week, in a seven-day week. So... Um, most likely, cars that are aut autonomous um, could could maybe do a third of the hours in the week, or something like that. Um, so maybe they do, I don't know, sixty hours a week of of usage instead of twelve. So you've got basically a five x increase in in asset utilization there, um, and far less need for uh, parking lots, parking garages, and that kind of thing. So. Um, but this is in itself is good for the environment because you, you need fewer cars to get the same thing done, um, and and we would need fewer parking garages and, and places just to keep cars um, when they're not in use because they'd be just being in use a lot more. So, <clears throat> um, but the net, the net of the net of like having a lot of cars times uh, automation or times self driving I think is at the heart of why um, a lot of investors think Tesla is worth what it is. Um, they're giving us a lot of credit for future execution. But I, I think the trend is there. It's, it's quite positive. And I'd like to once again say, if anyone is interested in in practical AI, um, AI that, that where, the, where the rubber hits the road, uh, please join Tesla's um, auto, autopilot, autopilot slash AI team. I think people don't quite appreciate that, that Tesla has some of the most advanced AI in the world, both on the software side and on the hardware side. And on the on the software on you know on the hardware side we've obviously got our uh, inference computer which I think is still the best inference computer out there even though it's been going for a couple of years um, and uh, and then we're, we're we're building Dojo which is will be the most most powerful training computer because um, it's got to process vast amounts of uh, video training data um, and, um, and and bring bringing the day of self driving sooner is translates directly to live saves and live saved and uh, injuries avoided because mm -hmm. uh, about a million people die every year in car accidents and about 10 million per year have serious injuries mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, the sooner the better um, and a, a lot of lives will be saved and lives people's lives made better if, uh, if it comes happen sooner <laughs> Elon on, on self-driving you know you made headlines I think a while back when you basically you know to put it mildly criticized lidar as a key technology for self-driving. Could you talk more about that and why, you know, you're not such a huge fan of LiDAR? Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes I'm just talking smack, you know. 
Um, <laughs> no, we didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's, 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 it's time you, it's time you knew. I said, <laughs> we took those tweets seriously. I've, I confess. Um, so, um, yeah, so, um, um, you know, first of all, I'm not like farming against LiDAR you know, and all things because, you know, for, for the SpaceX Dragon at Duxford Space Station, uh, we, 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 um, we, we actually developed and, and bought, built our own LiDAR for docking with the space station. So obviously, if I hated LiDAR, we would not have done that. And this is well before, uh, this is like 10 years ago that we started doing that. So I'm not, I'm not like, I don't have some sort of weird, like, you know, antagonism to, to LiDAR. Um, the, the, however, for, the, for driving on real world roads, um, you, you have to solve uh, vision. You have to solve vision, basically understanding objects with passive optical, um, um, passive optical photons and, and, and then making sense of those objects. Um, so, so like vision, perception, what, what, what do those objects mean? What are they going to do? Uh, what, what is the likely path of, of travel um, and then control? And, and so, and, and all of that really is, you know, is AI. It's, it's, or, I mean, but the way we're doing it is by running a bunch of neural nets in our head. So we got to run a bunch of neural nets to do the same thing in the car. And at the point at which you've sold passive optical, and, and this is better passive optical than a human has, because you've got eight cameras, three of which uh, point directly forward, um, two that are diagonally forward, and, uh, and, and two that are diagonally rear, and one rear. So the way we do it right now is we have all eight cameras um, synchronized with, so you've got, um, eight frames collected simultaneously, um, and we're, we're um, moving towards, uh, and have in fact mostly moved towards uh, video training. So you've got you've got um, eight eight surround cameras. Um, this is it's like it's like kind of a surreal thing to see because uh, people look you know really people have two eyes, but kind of like really more like one eye because uh, the, the two <laughs> eyes kind of combine. Um, but anyway, the neural net is it basically it needs to move to full uh, video training, video inference, uh, sur surround video training, surround video in inference, um, and then it will be superhuman, um, no question about it. Um, like it, there's just because people don't have eyes in the back of their head, like they can't. They got to. You basically have effectively a human, for all intents and purposes, has it's like having one camera on a slow gimbal, um, and and that is often distracted. Uh, and or, and maybe sort of drunk or you know change the radio or um, may fall asleep or you know there's all sorts of things that go wrong. Um, there's no question that you can get, be superhuman with just cameras. Um, and I think if one is going to go with uh, sort of active photon generation, I would recommend something in the occlusion penetrating uh, wavelengths. Uh, you know, so like radar. You know, it's sort of roughly four millimeter radar or something like that um, would be better if you're gonna really delve into the uh, arena of active photon generation. Wow, okay, uh, that's amazing. Okay, uh, also I love uh, how uh, DP got into that, it was super, super fun. All right, I'm gonna switch topic just a bit. Um, I would say, I would. it's safe to say a lot of people are very interested in how you work. Um, and you often, for example, describe yourself as an engineer. So walk us through, it's Monday morning, you wake up. What does a day, a typical work day in the life of Elon look like? <clears throat> um, I guess I, I wake up and, and, and see if there are any <clears throat> emergencies uh, by, on text or email. Uh, and often there are. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, the, a, t a ton of what I deal with is not uh, actually fun or, or interesting. It's like chores. So I've tried really hard not to do my chores, but then if I don't do my chores, things go to hell. So, oh man, you have to do your chores. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's basically, kind of, it's, uh, I'm a bit relieved that Elon Musk basically has the same schedule as the rest of us. You know, we all do chores and you do too. And it's kind of, there's something just really relieving uh, just hearing you say that. Yeah. Um, I mean that's pretty much how it goes these days. Uh, 
I do enjoy the in-person meetings more than email. In fact, I have a, I think I'm getting like uh, a slight like negative like limbic reaction to email. <laughs> it's killing me. <laughs> um, texts are, are way better to deal with, um, and and then in-person meetings are are much better. Uh, even Zoom meetings or whatever, you know, they're still better than email. Anything's better than email, frankly. <laughs> um, so. So anyway, I'll, I'll have a bunch of meetings. Uh, I'll write email or write text, um, you know, especially if it's like a, an email to the group, like saying, hey, we need to, I think we need to change direction and do the following things. Um, and let me know if you think otherwise, but otherwise we've got to do these these things and, and get, our, get our act together in this area or that area. Um, and then, yeah, a bunch of meetings. Um, most of my meetings are engineering and design, um, but of course we have to deal with uh, finance and you know, sales and, and other things, and um, you know the, the things that are necessary for a company to function. And and then I, then there's uh, this uh, quite a lot of, a lot of context switching. Um, and uh, somebody sent me the meme of like, fear is not the mind killer. Context switching is the mind killer, which I totally agree with. Um, context switching is a real bear. Uh, so. Just try, try to basically try to do less context switching. So maybe focus on one thing for an hour and then another thing for another hour. Um, it, it's really hard to context switch between SpaceX and Tesla and all the things that are going on mm -hmm. at SpaceX and Tesla, uh, and then and then Neuralink, boring company, uh, which which fortunately pretty low low bandwidth. Low, mm -hmm. They don't take a high level of CPU load because they're smaller, uh, and there's their personal stuff and. And of course, uh, memes. You know, gotta get. Gotta, <laughs> That's important. How can you them in? Like, like, where's my meme? Uh, we're expecting a meme by now. <laughs> You're calling up your meme dealer for your hit of memes. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Elon, you know, earlier last year, I spoke to Mark about how he spends his time, and Mark talked about, you know, you know, you know, when he was younger, he used to have large blocks of open time on his calendar, and I think a lot of you know, well-known founders have large blocks of open time versus schedule time. Now, you are unique because you have multiple companies you're running. You're also much more of an engineer than traditional CEOs. What does your calendar look like? You have just, you know, are you allocated 30 minutes back to back? You have a lot of open space. Well, how do you handle it? Uh, I don't have a lot of open space. It's generally back to back meetings and it's insane. I, I mean, my, my, my days are like insane torrents, torrents of information. Um, I mean, for, so sometimes people like, if you want to like audit what I do for a day, it, it it's insane. Uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 mean, I mean, yeah, this, uh, I was thinking like, man, how long can I keep this up? This, Cause I, I don't want my brain to explode. Um, and, and it's like the meetings that are scheduled are not like uh, nice to have meetings. They're like, this meeting is essential. Like, okay. Um, it's it's pretty intense. Um, I was thinking like maybe I should like at some point like take a week off or something, you know, clear my mind. Um, or, or like I know there's like a ton of bunch of people like writing books on Tesla and SpaceX, for example. Like it, it, it's pretty pretty hard for them to get it right because the you know they just weren't there. And maybe I should like write some like book of my experiences that has. Like you know, all the foolish mistakes I've done, and like you know, some advice for others that might be helpful. I think so. A book, uh, a documentary. I think you know. I mean, uh, I remember uh, once hearing about how. Do you still sleep on the floor of your factory? I, I remember you used to at one point in time. Um, I did. I, I haven't. I only if there's like a crisis situation, um, and. You know, I, I actually, it, it's like basically when, when the team is being asked to do, to, to really work super hard, I, I, I got to be right there with them um, and they got to, they got to see it, you know, seeing is believing. And so if I'm just sleeping in the middle of the factory floor and, you know, you know, sort of going to sleep at four in the morning and like, you know, waking up like four hours later and like they literally see me, they walk past me. Um, it's not like hidden or anything and it's like okay CEO is willing to fucking take that level of pain then then they'll do it too 
I was going to say, when, when you first said you slept in the factory, I figured, you know, there must be like an executive floor or something and you must have like a couch and it must be like a nice setup. And then, um, you know, when I when I came over, when I came over to see you that one time, um, you know, it's like you have your, your conference room is literally, literally in the middle of the factory. Um, and like the, the giant, sure, I'm pardon my, 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 my swearing, but I have to, the giant fucking robots are like 15 feet away. Yeah. And they're, they're pounding metal and it's like ear splitting and your factory is like literally, or your, your room is like literally right in the middle of them. And then I, at, at least I saw your, your like sleeping bag in the conference room. So I assume that's where you're sleeping. <laughs> and I didn't see any of the rooms. Like, yeah, so actually, it's not just actually, sleeping in the middle of the factory. It's like, it, that's intense. Uh, most of the time, I did, I did not sleep in the conference room because people could not see me in the conference room. So I slept um, on the floor outside the conference room. Because otherwise, how do people know? You know, <laughs> yep. like, they don't know. I, 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 seeing's believing. So I, I, I mostly just sleep on the floor outside the conference room so they could see that I was there. Yep, that's that's an even 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 more advanced level. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 world of hurt. And I always would wake up and smell like, like oil and iron filings. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was rough. <laughs> yeah, but I was, I, was, I was asking people to really go all out, you know, and I can't expect them to go all out if I'm not doing the same thing. It, that's super interesting because when people think, you know, and you know, again, I'm not saying this to flatter you, when people think, that how does the richest person in the world live? They don't think uncomfortably sleeping outside a conference room with like a lot of loud banging going on right next door. They, they probably don't, but people, the people at the factory do. They, they saw it themselves. I love it. That's what, and that, that's what's important, you know. Okay, I love it. Um, okay, switching topic just a little bit. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, okay, you have your hands full with SpaceX and Tesla, you know, and the Boring Company and Neuralink. If you had to start, uh, if you somehow magically found an extra five hours in a day and you had to start another company or another effort, what would you start? Well, I I'm, I'm definitely have no plans to start yet another thing. Um, <laughs> you have all the free time. Man, Look at you. Um, yeah, I, my head will definitely explode. It's, uh, it's like I, that gladiator I, meme. Are you not entertained enough? Have you not created <laughs> enough companies? <laughs> 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 Indeed. Um, I, I think there are st still tremendous opportunities in tunneling. Um, you know, for, for five years, I, people asked me, what, what do I see opportunities? And I'd say tunneling. And then nobody did anything. So then, actually, initially, as a joke, created the boring company. Um, just And, and did, did a, we did like a test tunnel in LA. And then still people didn't believe us. And then, so we, we just did our first operational tunnel in Vegas. Um, but the, the world really needs tunnels in because all major cities have traffic and tunnels can um, ha massively improve people's quality of life uh, by, by making it easier to travel from one place to another in a city. And then that can be further expanded to long distance travel, uh, where if you just draw a vacuum on the tunnel, then you can go extremely fast, faster than a, a plane and faster than a, a plane or a high speed rail. Um, so I'd really still recommend, uh, can someone else say, please start a tunneling company? That'd be great. Um, then there's uh, RNA or mRNA, um, basically synthetic viruses, uh, which is uh, we've seen put to good effect with uh, BioNTech and Moderna. Um, but I think people don't quite, quite appreciate that uh, that what's actually going on is the digitization of medicine. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's where you can just literally, uh, you know, create an RNA or DNA sequence like a computer program, and then uh, it caps encapsulate that in a uh, you, you have to multiply it many many millions of times um billions of times and encapsulate that in a lipid shell so it looks like a tasty treat for your cells um, and you can literally do anything um this is absolutely the future of medicine um i mean it, when i said i mean it, you, could, you could you could probably figure out how to turn someone into a literal butterfly <laughs> okay that's it's it's it's, it's your, your cells are biological computers they they execute just like a, like a sort of old school computer where you'd feed it like a you know if you'd, you'd feed it a, t a tape uh, you know or a, or a punch card uh, that's that's you, you feed the, the your cells which are tiny tiny biological computers this, this punch card and they will do whatever they, that punch card says um, so that, that 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 was probably a big eye opener last for 2020 of like just the the I was saying the potential of uh, RNA 
Um, and then just super randomly, Tesla actually is <laughs> making a fairly advanced uh, RNA sort of microfab or something where for um, currently for CureVac, but we're open to, to making it for other companies as well. Um, uh, wait, wait, wait. I, I don't think I, I, I'm not sure I understand this. Why is Tesla making an RNA fab? Uh, it's, it's super random. So <laughs> like about four, <laughs> a little over four years ago, we acquired a company in Germany um, primarily for, um, they're, they're very good at, at automation. It's called, uh, they were called um, Groman. And they're, they're in southern Germany near uh, basically a city of Prom. And um, the, at, at the time of the acquisition, they, they said, like, look, we're willing to be acquired, but there's like just a couple of projects that we think, even though they're not related to automotive, we really like to continue, if you don't mind. Um, I was, I was like, and uh, the, the two projects were one is, one is this like tiny chip analyzer, or like a thing with tiny wires for in, analyzing uh, chips that Intel needs. Um, for, for making CPUs, and then another one was this uh, bi biotech thing uh, for, it, it's basically a, a well, there's, 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 th there's three parts to it. There's a DNA multiplier, an RNA multiplier, and something which puts then the lipid shell on the RNA sequence. Um, we're on like version three of it now, and they, they said, could they keep going? I said, well, if you keep it under 10% of resources, no problem, you can keep going. And then I don't know. It turned out like it, it turns out it may actually be useful. I, I just love that you accidentally found yourself with an RNA fab. Um, by the way, I think yeah. I, I, you've been talking a lot about how mRNA obviously has been key to the Moderna vaccines and all the COVID nineteen vaccines. Uh, which brings me to COVID. Um, let us say somehow magically tomorrow you were running the vaccine effort, the distribution effort right now. What would you do to get the vaccines out? Yeah, uh, specifically around the delivery and the logistics side, which we just don't seem to be doing a really good job across the world. So what would you do differently there? Um, well, I, I don't have good insight into the situation as it stands, but I think um, relaxing the requirements on this, like, seems to be, um, there, there are too many requirements of who can get the vaccine. Um, the, the vaccine really um, is important for anyone with that that is elderly or has uh, a compromised immune system, um, or is otherwise at risk for the virus. Um, and I, I would I think really just saying like, you know, first come first serve, show up, show up uh, here. Like use um, CVS and Walgreens, which which yeah. give out the flu vaccine every year, mm -hmm. and say okay, just just show up here. And uh, you know, especially for the Moderna and BioNTech. Uh, vaccines which are quite temperature sensitive they, they can only be um sort of defrosted from from the deep deep freeze briefly and then they must be used or they they lose their effectiveness um this is because the uh my understanding is is the is the rna the, the, because the the rna sequences they use are not stable those those sequences want to revert uh to something else um because they're not stable they must be frozen at a very low temperature, uh, or they will s simply re want to revert to a lower energy state um, RNA sequence. That's my understanding of it. Um, so just like, instead of worrying about like, just, is the exact right person going to get the, the vaccine? Like just accept that maybe some people who shouldn't get the vaccine will get it, but we'll still get a hell of a lot more vaccines out there. And, and, um, and, and let's not worry about the details here. Let's just get it to as many people as, as possible, as quickly as possible. And for sure, we should not worry about the second dose quite yet. Just give everyone the, the first dose. I suspect the, that the the immunity granted by the first dose is very significant. Um, and we've got, you know, the, the, that third dose, the second dose is like I think three or four weeks later. So uh, we'll have, we've got plenty of time to think about the second dose. So just, just worry about the first dose and first come, first served. And, and don't worry about like accidentally give the damn, giving the damn thing to someone who maybe didn't deserve it. That will happen a little bit. Um, so that's my recommendation on that front. Um, we are going to be, there's go, there is going to be a, an, an avalanche of vaccine coming. Um, I think the U.S. may have ordered on the order, of, they may have ordered something like 900 million doses. <laughs> Step by. Um, and and the, the combination of, of, of there's going to be a, we were going to have so many, so much, uh, a COVID vaccine, I guarantee you it will be thrown away uh, later this year. 
more than we could possibly ever need or want. Um, and the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine just got approved, which is, um, that, that's good because that's a, it's more, it's a more conventional vaccine, but it's a single shot, room temperature. Um, and, and there are more and more vaccines that are going to get approved. Uh, hopefully the CureVac one will be approved soon. Um, and um, I, I know because I know the Tesla machine, it can make a bazillion doses super fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I think there's, there's definitely, um, for those who are concerned about the vaccine, I should, you should expect an exponential increase in vaccine availability. And then combined with that, we, we, we are, I think, starting to approach uh, some degree of herd immunity um, with you know people who contract the virus and um, and and, and uh, recovered, so uh, which is actually better than getting a vaccine. Um, the antibody re reaction is um, better than if you got the vaccine. So um, yeah, um, could go on and on about it, but I, overall, I think you know optimistic message that there will be lots of vaccines, and uh, I would really encourage people to take the vaccine. I am not an anti-vaxxer, <laughs> I want to be clear. <laughs> I'm a pro-vaxxer. <laughs> so, you know, speaking of the vaccine, you know, California has, you know, has been sort of bouncing between kind of 40th, 45th and 50th in the country, you know, by states in terms of the, the speed of the rollout. And it, 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 for me, it sort of, you know, it re-raises this question that's been coming up more and more, which is, you know, you, you and I and a lot of people, you know, here listening have like, you know, built our companies, you know, primarily in California uh, up until now. Um, what's your view on the future of California uh, from here? Well, I mean, first of all, I should say I love California and I've, I've been, I've, I've lived half my life and more than half my life in California. Just, you know, um, like I am, you know, Californian, you know, I, like so much of my I mean, I built my companies here. Uh, you know, came here as a as a summer came to Silicon Valley as a summer intern to work on uh, on energy storage technology for electric vehicles way back in like '92, I think it was '92 or '93. Uh, There's a little company called Pinnacle Research in Los Gatos. Um, I mean, I got to Silicon Valley as soon as I could, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and then at Stanford, I was going to be working on. Um, sort of advanced capacitors for use in electric vehicles as grad studies and end up putting that on hold for the internet. And um, yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, uh, try to get a job at Netscape, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, what? I have, I have heard that story indirectly. Um, I, yeah. I, I would actually, I would actually like for you to tell it so that I can, I can learn what, what, what mistake I made. Okay. Well, first of all, I wouldn't say I did a very good job of trying to get a job at Netscape, but I was like, I was convinced that, that the internet would be the future, you know, essentially the humanity communicated by osmosis until until then. But with the internet, it would be like humanity acquiring a nervous system and becoming much more of a super organism. And um, so I was like, okay, well, I could do a PhD at Stanford on uh, sort of advanced capacitors for use in electric vehicles, um, which may or may not be successful. Uh, like I could get the PhD, but would it be useful or not? Uncertain. Um, or I could be part of building the internet, um, which was, uh, so it's either like do a PhD and watch the internet get built right in front of me, or mm -hmm. put study, grad studies on hold and, and, and try to help, you know, build the internet, internet in some way. And like, you know, I mean, you're basically the only internet company. Um, um, <laughs> so yep. so I, sent, I, sent my, I sent my resume and, and I was like, didn't get any feedback. Um, and, and, and then I, and then, uh, then I tried hanging out in the lobby, but I was too shy to speak to anyone. Um, and I was like, man, what if Charlotte and I am sitting in this lobby? Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. And, 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 and then I just started writing software myself because uh, I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll just write software myself. And I actually wrote the first maps and directions on the internet. I don't, I'm not sure how many people are aware of that, but yeah. the, the first, maps, first maps directions, yellow pages and white pages. I, I wrote it personally. <laughs> it was just me and my computer. And when we started our first company, we only had one computer. So the website only worked during the day because I was coding at night and then the server ran during the day. <laughs> so, um, that was, was quite an adventure, that's for sure. Um, yeah. So I, I just want to let you know that the next time you show up at one of my companies and hang out in the lobby for an internship, you're, you're going to get an internship. Wow, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, but but only if you get the stuff running 24/7 like you can't slack off at night yeah you have to keep it running. <laughs> uh, yeah no sleeping outside the conf rooms that's not okay yeah. we that's we will not, we will uh, provide you with not just one but two computers nice uh, <laughs> okay uh, i i want to you know uh, you know wrap up with some light questions for you which i think a lot of people are curious in um what are you what are you watching on tv what are you reading right now well um i just finished watching the last kingdom which i think is a great piece of you know mostly accurate historical uh drama um there's cobra kai which is if, if you grew up in it's so good <laughs> it's so it's, it's so good it's such a sick burn that that show my goodness um <laughs> that, that i mean they just like turn turn the knife constantly um and uh yeah um Let's see what else have we been watching. What do you uh, what do you, if I can uh, break it what do you what do you think of the expanse? Um I you know that yeah maybe I should start watching that. Um I think there were like some sort of like uh things about like having a shortage of water or something. Uh, so, there's something like so it didn't make any scientific sense at first so I was like come on this is dumb so then I stopped watching it but I it it sounds like uh maybe I should work you know keep watching it. I I need to I watch something on the treadmill otherwise I won't I work out cuz I hate working out. <laughs> yeah, I think you'll find I mean I think season 4 now I think you'll find it's it's apparently I think you'll know more than I will but the sort of most accurate representation of what, you know, actual space actual like interplanetary travel would be like, you know, once it's sort okay. of made routine. And, right. and by the way, the, the politics that flow, right? And so it sort of sets up a three-way battle between, you know, basically Earth and Mars and then the asteroid belt um and kind of gets all into right. all the <laughs> it's entirely possible cost. in the future. I would say that that's a that would be a good outcome because it means that you know humanity has actually made it out there, uh, as long as they don't and don't annihilate each other. Besides the ex- expanse, I mean, what do you recommend? Oh, um, have I you seen? Think I've got one for. Oh, I, I just got to bring one up. Um, Devs, spelled D-E-V-S. Yes. If, if you have not seen Devs, Dev is definitely the show for you, and I, I will not say any more, but you you will you will enjoy it. All right, Devs. Uh, oh, you know, a game that's pretty good is Mythic Quest. Yes, um, yes. Amazing. Oh my god, my favorite. <laughs> Best Apple TV show. Yeah, that's a good one. D- did you see the Ravens Banquet, the most recent one? <laughs> yeah, it's great. So good. <laughs> uh, have you seen Tenet yet, the new Christopher Nolan movie? Yes, it's pretty good. Wow, okay. And did you understand Tenet? Um Well, I think if you I think if you think too hard about Tenet, it's not going to make maybe a complete sense, but I enjoyed the movie. It's funny okay. because that's kind of what Nolan said too in one of the interviews. He said just don't like go deep into it, just enjoy it for the movie. And 4 hours like later I emerged from Reddit being like I still don't like entirely get it. So I should have <laughs> just been, you know, just skimmed through it and just watched it for the fun of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um okay Elon um you know I think you know I don't want, you don't want to take up too much of your time this has been amazing um you've pretty much broken clubhouse there are probably about like over a dozen maybe more overflow rooms and um I see so many twitter trends right now uh you've been so generous um for all your listeners here and on twitter you've been asking for people to join neuralink you've been asking for people to join tesla do you have any final thoughts for everybody who's listening to you right now well do, do you want to hear the real story um uh from Vlad from Robin Hood about what happened this week with GameStop. Uh uh but sure go for it. Okay, you need to like let him somehow click on a button so he can talk. Uh all right, let me figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> While we're figuring it out, Elon, why don't you talk to us about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy since you mentioned that right at the beginning? Uh yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Hit um Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy um but by, by Douglas Adams is is in fact a book of philosophy disguised as a silly humor book. Um and if you if you read it from the standpoint of wow, this is an interesting book of philosophy that is quite insightful. Um you know, as much as he really goes hits on the point of um the answer is easy once you properly can, can properly formulate the question. um and uh yeah um i mean i like the fact that the ship is powered by infinite improbability uh it's called the heart of gold um yeah yeah it's uh, <laughs> uh 
Um, he makes fun of, of bureaucracy. In fact, Earth essentially gets destroyed by a, 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 a sort of clerical error or <laughs> by the yeah. end. <laughs> I mean, essentially, but not even clerical error. They're like, they basically uh, decide that they need to have an interstellar highway and that Earth's in the way. And so they, 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 they post the fact that Earth needs to get destroyed for this interstellar highway. But of course, it's posted on an alien bullet board, bulletin board that no one on Earth can access. Um, and... Um, and so then that, they're surprised when people on Earth are unhappy about this. <laughs> it's like it was posted on the board. What do you mean? They're like, what board? Um, <laughs> um, so th some of the things in, in Doug Sadam's book, like the babble fish, where you put the fish in your ear, that tra automatically translates. We kind of have that already. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. the future is coming fast. Um, Elon, okay. Uh, Vlad, uh, can you hear us? Vlad the Stock Impaler. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for inviting me up. It's good to hang with all of you. All right, Vlad. I was, what really happened? Give us the inside scoop. All right. Well, I was actually hoping that uh, you would invite me up for the Fermi paradox part because um, this has been a very surreal weekend and week for me. Um, one of the really great things is all the people coming to uh, coming out of the woodwork to offer support for the company. Uh, offer, you know, advice. So um, I got introduced today. Um, and actually, I should say I just randomly downloaded Clubhouse a couple of days ago just to see what it was all about. So this is my first time literally using the app. But um, yeah, I, uh, I got introduced to uh, your friend Antonio Elon, who had some good advice for me and then introduced me to you. You had some great advice. And then I figured, you know, I heard about this clubhouse and uh, this has got to be part of the simulation. So I just uh, thought, why not? So here I am. So I'm, a I'm actually um, I'm actually an adherent to the simulation hypothesis. All right. Well, spill the beans, man. What happened last week? Why do you uh, stop? People? Why can people buy the GameStop shares? The people demand an answer and they want to know the details <laughs> and the truth. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. So let me let me start by giving a little bit of background. Um, so I'm the chief executive of Robinhood. Robin yeah, is actually. A, <laughs> Just go I'll, on. I'll man. go through this quickly. He's... Don't worry. This is this is uh, this is important. Um, it's actually uh, a couple of companies. So there's a an introducing broker dealer uh, called Robinhood Financial, and that basically is the app that you uh, know and love. It processes trades. Uh, you're a customer of, of Robinhood Financial. Then there's a clearing broker dealer, um, Robinhood Securities, that clears and settles the trades. And then we have Robinhood Crypto, um, which is our crypto business, um, all of which, uh, all of these are kind of different entities that are differently operated. So basically Wednesday of last week, uh, we just had, you know, unprecedented volume, unprecedented load on the system. Uh, a lot of these, you know, so-called meme stocks were, um, you know, going viral on social media and people were, um, people were joining Robinhood and there was a lot of net buy activity on them, um, as you guys all know. And Robinhood at this time, I think, was number one on the iOS app store. Um, and uh, pretty close, if not number one, on on Google Play as well. So just unprecedented yeah. activity. Um, and so Thursday morning, right? Um, so I'm I'm sleeping, uh, but at 3:30 a.m. Pacific, um, our operations team receives a file from the NSCC, which is the National Securities Clearing Corporation. So basically as a broker, as a clearing broker, um, and this is where Robinhood Securities comes in, we have to put up money to the NSCC um, based on some factors, including um, things like the volatility of the, uh, of the trading activity, concentration into certain securities. Um, and this is, this is the equities business. So it's based on stock trading and um, uh, not options trading or, or anything else. Um, so they gave us a file with the deposit and the, the request was around $3 billion 
um, which is, you know, about an order of magnitude more than what it typically is, right? So, um, no, no, why, why and, was that so high? Like, this seems like, like, it, it sounds like this is an unprecedented increase in uh, demand for capital. Um, what formula did they use to calculate that? Well, um, yeah, and just to give context, you know, Robinhood up until that point has raised, uh, you know, a little bit around $2 billion in total uh, venture capital up until now. So it's a big number, like $3 billion is um, is a large number, right? So um, basically the, and, you know, I the details are, we don't have the full details. It's a little bit of an opaque formula, but there's a component called the VAR of it, which is value at risk. And um, that's based on kind of some fairly quantitative things, although it's not it's not fully transparent. So uh, there are ways to reverse engineer it, but uh, it's not kind of publicly shared. Um, and then there's a special component, which is discretionary. Um, so that's that kind of acts as a multiplier. And um, basically it's discretionary, discretionary, meaning like it's just their opinion. Yeah, there. Uh, it's it's a little bit. I mean, I'm sure there's there's definitely more more than just their opinion, but um, basically, well, I mean, I, I guess like it's what based everyone, on growth. What everyone wants to know. What everyone wants to know is like, did something maybe shady go down here? Like, like it, it's like it seems weird that you'd get a sudden ten billion dollar demand. You know, three billion, three, three billion. billion in the morning. Sorry, how much? Yeah, it was three billion U.S. dollars. Three billion. Okay, so three billion yeah, around you know, just suddenly out of nowhere. Um, and what I wouldn't, I wouldn't impute, worth? I wouldn't impute shadiness to it or anything like okay. that. And actually, you know, the NSCC was reasonable subsequent to this. And, you know, they've been, they've been, uh, they worked with us to, um, to actually lower it. So, um, it was unprecedented activity. You know, we don't, I don't have the full context about, um, you know, what was, what was going on in what's going on in the, in the NSCC to make these calculations. But, um, yeah, essentially is anyone, it was is a large anyone holding you hostage right now? Uh, <laughs> no, no, Blink I'm twice. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks for asking. But anyway, so this was, uh, this was obviously nerve wracking and I actually was asleep at this point, you know, the operations team was, uh, was fielding this at, at three o'clock. And then, um, you know, we got back, we put our heads together. Um, you know, our chief operating officer basically said, look, let's call up the higher ups at the NSCC and kind of figure out what's going on. Maybe there's some way we can work with them. And, um, basically there was another call and they lowered it to something like $1.4 billion. Uh, from three. Okay. So, okay, we were making some progress, right? And then, <laughs> but it's still a high number. And then um, we basically proposed, well, let's, let's explain how we plan to, um, let's explain how, you know, we'll manage risk in these symbols throughout the day. Uh, we proposed um, marking these volatile stocks that were kind of driving, driving the activity position closing only. And then um, at about uh, an hour before market close, market open, so 5.30 or 5 in the morning, they came back and they said, okay, uh, the charge is, or the deposit 700 million, which we then deposited and paid promptly. And then um, everything was fine. Um, so that, that okay. essentially explains why we had to um, we had to mark these symbols position closing only and also why, you know, we didn't want to, we knew this was a bad outcome for customers. Um, you know, part of what's been really difficult is, um, Robinhood stands for, you know, democratizing access to stocks and yeah. we want, we want to give people the access. So that's been very, very challenging. Um, but we had no choice in this case. We had to conform to our regulatory capital requirements. And so the team did, uh, did what they could to make sure we were available for customers. Who, who controls this, this, this organization, this clearinghouse? 
Um, you know, it's a it's a consortium. It's not it's not quite a government agency. Um, you know, I I don't really know the details of of uh, of all of that. Okay, but you know, and to be fair, like we were we were. Uh, I, I think there was legitimate sort of turmoil in the markets. Like these are unprecedented events with these meme stocks and, you know, there was a lot of activity. So there probably is um, so, some amount of extra risk in the system that warrants higher, higher requirements. So it's not entirely unreasonable, um, but we did operational processes to make sure that customers that had positions could sell their open positions because obviously restricting someone we got a lot of questions about okay you had to restrict buying why didn't you also restrict selling and the fact uh -huh. of the matter is yeah. people get really pissed off if they're holding stock and they want to sell it and they can't right so i think that's that's categorically worse so um and lots of other brokers i think were in the same situation Robinhood was in the news but you you sort of heard this industry wide right other brokers uh, basically restricted the same exact activity. All right, so so it sounds like this this, this organization show, you know, calls you up and they basically have a gun to your head, either either hand over this money or or else. Um, and so, because I mean, like basically, what people are wondering is like, did did you sell your clients down the river or did you have no choice? And if you had no choice, that's understandable. But then, you know, we got to find out why you had no choice. And who are these people that are saying you have no choice? Yeah, um, I think that's fair. You know, we have to comply with these requirements. Financial institutions have requirements. Um, you know, the, the, the formula behind these requirements, um, I think um, it would obviously be ideal if there was a little bit more transparency so we could plan better around that. Um, you know, but to be fair, we were able to open and serve our customers and, um, you know, 24, 24 hours later, um, our team raised over a billion dollars in capital so that when we, when we did open, uh, well, when we do open tomorrow morning, uh, we'll be able to kind of relax the stringent position limits that we put on these securities on Friday. Will, will there be any limits? Well, I think there's always going to be some theoretical limit, like we don't have infinite capital, right? And on Friday, there were limits. Um, so there's always, there's always going to have to be some limit. I think the question is, you know, will the limits be high enough to the point where, you know, some, they, they won't impact, you know, 99.9 .9 plus percent of customers. Um, so, you know, if someone were to deposit a hundred billion dollars and and decide to trade in one stock like that that wouldn't be possible you know all right <laughs> all right well i guess people really just want to know you know if you had no choice then then you had no choice uh it's gun to head situation um and you know then that's understandable uh but then whoever put that gun to your head should you know be willing to answer to the public yeah listen and uh you know i know there's there's processes this is unprecedented times and to be fair to those guys they've been they've been reasonable so um we are i think the the one thing that is maybe not clear to people is Robin is a participant in the financial system. Um, so we have to work with all of these counterparties. So we do get a lot of questions about, you know, why do you work with market makers? Why do you work with clearing houses? Uh, vertically integrating and getting, um, I mean, it's hard enough to, to build a introducing and a clearing broker dealer. Not too many people have done that. But the financial system that uh, allows customers to trade shares um, is sort of a complex web of multiple parties. And, um, you know, it's it's hard to, I think everyone says oh, it could be better, it could be improved. Um, it's it's just the necessity of, of trading equities in the U.S. that you have to do all these things. I mean, to what degree are you beholden to Citadel? I mean, like, like basically, if Citadel's unhappy, then I, I, what then what happens? 
Yeah, so that, you know, there was a rumor that uh, Citadel uh, or other market makers kind of pressured us into doing this. And now that's just false, right? Um, market makers execute our trades. They execute trades of, of every broker dealer. Um, you know, this was this was a clearinghouse um this was a clearinghouse decision and it was just based on the capital requirements. So, um, from our perspective, you know, Citadel and other market makers, um, weren't involved in that. But wouldn't they have a strong say in, in who got put in charge of that organization since it's an industry consortium, not a government consortium or not a government regulatory agency? Um, I, I don't have any reason to believe that. I think that's just like, you know, then you're getting into kind of the conspiracy theories a little bit. So I just have no no reason to believe that that's the case, you know. OK. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I um, guess uh, so we'll see what happens with future actions. Um, hopefully that wow. was... Uh, Insightful or you know, at least a little bit entertaining. Are you not entertaining? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, I, I don't know what to say. First of all, Vlad, uh, thank you so much for jumping on. I know it's pretty late, and uh, thank you so much. You know, deep. You know, I deeply appreciate it, and I'm sure everyone in the audience here and watching elsewhere deeply appreciate it. So thank you so much. We really appreciate this. Um, I'm going to wrap this up, uh, Elon. Uh, what can I say? You know, uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm I hope you had a, a fun time for your first time on Clubhouse. Did you have fun? Yeah, it's great. This is awesome. I didn't even know it existed a week ago, so, so it seems cool. Awesome. So, would you come back? Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. 